the monster will never come back. The monster will never come back. And because it felt like such a different, it felt so much worse than it had ever been before. Fluency is an important category when determining whether or not a narrative is reliable. Fluency has to do with flow. Instead of skipping steps in the narrative and inserting reflections, the subject speaks more or less directly. Being direct shows us that what they're saying isn't sensitive to them, meaning that they don't show any signs of withholding information or making up the story as they go. I've also worked with the notion narrative balance in previous videos. In short, narrative balance has to do with the different parts we expect to find in a narrative. The most important one being the critical event, which is what actually took place. We expect the critical event to be specific and consistent. In what we're about to see, Heard interrupts a narrative multiple times to give speculations or reflections or to dramatize events. She's so focused on being perceived as a victim that she forgets that she has to substantiate the criminal claims she's made about death. I spoke to him when I was in New York on the phone and he said that he was, um, ha he had a chip or that he was going to meetings, that he, uh, I, I think at the time mentioned a sober, uh, a another celebrity that was kind of advising him on sobriety or not advising him, but, you know, encouraging him. And he was saying, well, look, you know, me and this person, we're, we're doing, we're even went to a meeting. Um, I've got three days sober, four days sober. And that was the last time the monster will never come back. The monster will never come back. Hurts repetition. The monster will never come back. The monster will never come back. It's called an episusis. The repetition of a word or a phrase in quick succession. It's a way to emphasize a phrase in order to increase its impact and hence its memorability. And in a court case, you want the jury members to not only remember what you've said, but you also want your words to resonate with them. And because it felt like such a different... It felt so much worse than it had ever been before. And because I had, you know, Went, I went to New York and I was trying to get my strength to leave him. I actually thought that it kind of would be the turning point. It, I thought I had effectively... Objection, Your Honor, non-responsive. Oh, oh, overruled. Oh, okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Please continue. She's completely stopped speaking about her phone call with Deb, which is what this narrative started out with. Instead, she's made it about her strength. Heard knows which buzzwords to use, and this sounds very much like a go-to narrative when she's having trouble completing the actual narrative. On another note, we notice how quickly Heard breaks character when she faces opposition. I thought I had effectively... Objection, Your Honor, non-responsive. Oh, oh, overruled. Oh, okay. Thank you. Which leaves room to doubt the reliability of her suffering facial expressions and later crying. Unwillingly, she herself points to this reliability issue. In the following, she rapidly sums up the narrative she started. I thought I, I thought things would change. Okay. Overall, she's given very few details about the phone call. This isn't a typical critical event. It's centered on her reflections, tailored for this trial, to make her sound trusting. And the dramatization continues. Did, did you communicate to Mr. Deb what you had drafted in the email? And don't, you, you don't get to say what you said? Yes. Okay. Hertz attorney whispers and thus adds to the already painfully obvious pathos appeal, appeal to emotion and pity. Pathos yes. is typically okay. a defense team's dominant appeal when it's difficult for them to provide evidence. However, in comparison to the tape recordings we've heard, and the quite revealing and at times unhinged behavior on Hurt's part, the portrayal of Hurt being an innocent victim is a stretch. Nevertheless, the pathos continues when Hurt's defense team tries to portray Deb as the only bad partner in the short marriage he and Hurt had. Apparently, Hurt's now almost too sad to even speak. 
We should always be critical of this in a courtroom. Crying is not only manipulative, it also buys the subject more time to think about what to say, and it makes it seem okay that it takes a long time for them to answer. And what, if any, response did Mr. Depp have to your sending that email to him? He... He came to New York to fight for the relationship, for me, to prove that he was sober and he was committed to changing. I believed he was embarrassed and sorry he said he was, and I believed him. So I took him back, or I got back with him. On the condition that he would uphold his promise to do the treatment, to do the full detox, clean up, and never go back. Again, Heard as the hopeful and trusting partner, and Deb as the deceptive partner, who was allegedly embarrassed and sorry. Both adjectives assign blame to Deb and Deb alone. The pause from Heard's attorney is also a pathos appeal, adding to the touching moment, at least in theory, or only in theory, depending on one's viewpoint, of course. Next, she's asked about what happened when Dr. Kibber got involved. Notice how during her narrative, she makes sure to keep emphasizing her experience, what she hoped for, as if she was the innocent bystander who cheered Deb on. This is a pattern throughout her testimony, rehearsed words and phrases. So I'm going to take you now up to the June through August 2014 time frame. Uh, and I think you testified earlier, and others have as well, that Mr. Depp brought in Dr. Kipper and his group, correct? Yes, he okay. did. Um, can you please describe for the jury what those next few months were like? All of a sudden, um, this doctor gets brought on that had that we had been talking about. I had heard this name before. And all of a sudden, this doctor, Dr. Kipper, who apparently wrote a book on addiction and was this doctor who was going to be the solution, the, the cure, you know. Uh, and he got, he got brought on board. And all of a sudden, the plan was that this team would be involved in Johnny's recovery. So it felt real. It felt serious. I felt like protected. You know, I had already by this point heard a million times, it seems like, a promises to get clean and sober, but this felt like a change. And uh, they were going to come to Boston and start working with Johnny, and the plan was to keep Johnny on, a, on the same level of drugs that he was on since he was filming. They needed him to finish filming the movie, uh, so he was going to be maintained with his um, prescri with prescription pills, including the painkillers. Next, it's about portraying Deb as having a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde-like personality. This is a common psychological tool that defense teams use, particularly when the evidence of illegal activity is scarce or non-existent. This split personality is contrasted with Heard as the alleged helper. But he... His behavior, his whole personality changed drastically. He would be speaking to me. And at the time I was staying in Boston with him, ha having wrapped my movie, and he would, in mid-sentence, mid mid-word, fall asleep. Uh, it, one time I was sitting across from him, and he would come in and out of uh, sleep, of uh, being awake or completely what appeared to be asleep 
while talking to me and he had a cigarette in his hand and, you know, Johnny constantly smoked and he just sat the cigarette, you know, as he fell asleep while speaking down on his leg. They're hand rolled cigarettes. They don't stay lit um, very long, thankfully. But, you know, he, it was things like that and I didn't understand it. Even though I had experience with drug use um, in my family, I, I hadn't seen anything like this. And it was so dramatic, the change, that I was trying to figure out with the nurses and doctors wh what happened, what changed, how we could explain the change and what medications were causing it. I knew there were new medications involved. So, you know, I was constantly um, worried and in communication and the emotions would change from one to the next, like by the, by the second. It, it, the this part of Hurt's testimony is an ad hominem. Ad hominems are directed against a person rather than the position he or she is maintaining. Attacking the person, not the cause. What Hurt's defense team should be doing and should have been able to do by now is to establish that Debs done something illegal, but rather than providing evidence, they try to smear him as much as possible, which is ironic since this is a defamation trial. Obviously, they use his weaknesses against him, the weaknesses he's already admitted to. Like Hurt says, she had never seen anything like it, which makes Depp's situation sound particularly bad. Next, Hurt is visibly concerned with what the jury thinks about her performance, and the pathos continues. I remember we were on a long weekend when he was filming in Boston and we went to this like ho like a resort retreat hotel and you know he was just bawling you know I it broke my heart there was just a lot of changes and I I, I really didn't know um, I felt so bad for him and I, I thought maybe it was just what Kipper had introduced into the regime the medications but what I found out in in that time is that he was taking about double the Objection, amount. Objection, Your Honor. Hearsay. Was no, I, your saw, observations? I saw it. Okay. I, Overruled. Thank you. Please, please continue. She makes sure to say she felt bad for Deb, again sounding like the sympathetic helper. But logically, she couldn't have felt that bad because he's obviously willing to use his weaknesses against him now in this trial. Next, we learn the real reason for these long descriptions of Deb's problems and her as a helper. When I realized the amount was about double, he I realized then he had been lying to them and me about the amount so that he could get extra high before he had a detox. It was about establishing Deb as a liar. If he's lied in the past, he can lie in the present. That's what they want the jury members to infer. They want the jury members to think bad about Deb as a person in order to compensate for the fact that they don't have any direct evidence of what Hurt claims that Deb did to her. Hurt ends with what she's rehearsed, focusing on how bad it was for her. Pathos is a preferred or only appeal. But that I can't dis that, that I was so it was such an agonizing few that weeks, months. It was so agonizing. I don't know how long it lasted, but I was so concerned for this person and he had just been doubling up his meds because he didn't. You can find the links to my previous videos about this case in the description box below. If you haven't already, subscribe to stay updated about this case and other cases. Welcome to the channel.